What up, family? I'm excited to go through some of these songs from your catalog today, but like some of your songs from your catalog for other musicians. And I, and I want to start with this one. Take a listen. Radio's play this That is Destiny's Child featuring a young Beyonce Knowles. The remix to their 1997 debut single, No, No, No. Also the very first hit single. The man behind that remix is my guest, Wyclef Sean. Was that the first record you produced outside of your stuff with the Fugees? Um, nah, that was the first one that hit outside of the Fugees. So what happened was I had just got off the carnival. Shout out to Beyonce, shout out to Kelly. I was actually with Kelly Rowland in the Hampton a few days ago and I dropped that for fun. So um, the record is, is the history is kind of cool because I got a call from a product manager. and was like, yo, we got these four girls in the hotel. You should go hear them, you know? And I heard them, I was like, yo, sing a church song for me, you know? And then I went to Texas, I recorded the record um, you know, I was like, okay, the only other person that was rap singing at the time was Lauren. So I was like, okay, if I could come up with a formula and I did it. And then after that, guess what was the coolest thing about this? If you look up the Beyonce interview when she's talking about me is that I bought them on tour with me after this record. And guess what? We was touring Canada. And she always talked about like Clef gave her you know, them, they first break and brought them on tour with them. So I would say the coolest thing about that record as a producer and being in the studio. And then after that, having Destiny Child on tour with me was how Beyonce was a sponge and just sucking up everything. And I was like, she's definitely going to be a monster. You knew then that she was going to be a monster. Well, all you got to go is listen to the record. I said they went from a dream to the young Supremes, baby. <laughs> Let's let's talk about that. I mean, in terms of your vision there, No, No, No was a, a massive slow jam in its own right. What was your vision for the remix? Well, I felt that at the time, though, they from Texas, you feel me? And in Texas, the rappers were rapping at a certain speed, right? So Texas rappers was like, you know what I mean? And then in the East Coast, we more was like, this is what we do, what we doing, what we do. So I was like, but what happens is if I take that rhythm now that they're doing in Texas and I put melodies to it. I remember uh, watching a Jay-Z interview and he said the first time he heard that, he was like, whoa, these girls are singing too fast. You see what I'm saying? But I had them singing like Jay-Z was rapping when he did that speed rap. You see what I'm saying to you? Yeah, we, we kind of take that for granted, but Beyonce singing double time on that beat wasn't something we saw a lot back then. Well, it wasn't like, think about it. Like, so the double time is the trap of today. You know what I'm saying? So everything is like, hey, hey, better, better, right? The double time. So, so in that era to take a slow jam and to say, I'm going to put, a double time beat, it was like really weird. You know what I'm saying to you? It was like, yo, how are you going to get them? You know, and Beyonce understood it. I explained the scheme and it was amazing. Let's listen to another track. Take a listen to this. If I had walked into the studio the day you recorded that song with Carlos Santana, what would I have seen? I think like, so when you see Carlos Santana and he'll tell the story, it's online. He'll be like, yo, Clef just walked in. And I didn't actually start the composition on guitar. I started it on Fender Rhodes. So the first part of the groove that I came up with was bump, ba ba bump, 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 right? And you literally would have just seen how I was coming up with the master part of that groove. You know what I'm saying to you, which was the pinnacle to the whole groove. You know what I'm saying to you. I heard a story that when you got in there, you didn't recognize Carlos, like you hadn't seen him as an as a grown up or something like that. No, the story is that who didn't know who Carlos Santana was was the vocalist that I brought in, the younger kids, and. Cause I wanted a singer 
that had like a David Ruffins or old school vibe. You see what I'm saying to you against the record. And it was amazing because I was asking the kids like, yo, do you know who Carl is? I was like, then I put them on game. I was like, yo, this is who this guy is. This is what he done. And they were, of course, once again, discovery amazed and, and went and looked up everything Santana. So when he walked into that room, it must've been pretty powerful. Yeah, it's powerful because, you know, Santana's like a guitar god to me as a guitar player. And the thing is, what people have to understand is what I do is I write themes, right? So I don't only write music, I write scores and I write themes. So when I do a presentation of how I write a song, I think of the entire vision of the song. So for me, I looked at Carlos Santana, I understood the history and a movie that kept coming back in my head was West Side Story. So I was like, if I could do a theme around the record Maria Maria, um, then I think we got something we could go with. You've sampled your fair share of songs too throughout your career. There's one in particular I want to talk about. Take a listen to this. That is Bodisha by Enya, a song famously sampled by Wyclef's group The Fugees for their hit single Ready or Not. Here's what I want to know. How did that song first get on your radar? I was up on Enya. You know what I'm saying? Like I would go to the record stores. Like I was like the the thug weirdo to my friends. I'm like, yo, what are you listening to? You see what I'm saying to you? And you and though, then, I never well, really got like I like all that kind of like Irish like I play Irish music and all that. I never really got into Enya. Like it, it all felt massage music y to me, you know? Nah, like we was in the hood. We loved it. So um there was a movie called Sleepwalker. You ever seen that? Uh no, no. So in the movie Sleepwalker, this song is in there. So one night I'm in the hood. And I fell asleep and wake up to Sleepwalker and I'm hearing the sample again. So what I did was I looped the sample on the MP and just put some drums on it and just laid it there and then fell asleep. You see what I'm saying? And then the next day when L came and I was like, yo, check this beat out. I was sleeping when I made it, Sleepwalker. So that's why the record start. I say, now that I awake, sleep. And now that I wake, sleepwalk awake. Those who could relate know the world ain't. Now that I escape sleep, Walker awake. That's from the movie. You see what I'm saying? So literally I'm rapping about exactly what happened. You know what I'm saying? And then Elle came in and then she just started singing like, ready or not. And that, that's how the record was birthed. That record, literally, I did. That's why the whole record just sound like the sample and a drum kit, right? Because all I did was loop it and put some drums on it. And I felt like, yo, this is just a vibe, you know? I mean, fa- the famous story here is, so the commercial success of, of Ready or Not helps make the Fuji's album, The Score, one of the biggest selling hip hop albums of all time. But that sample, that Enya sample, almost gets the album pulled from the record shelves. What, what happens there? Well, I mean, you know, keep in mind, this is Young Clef, so I don't know I have to clear samples at the time. You dig? Yeah. So, and then, so... We're clearing, they're clearing samples, Sony is, but somehow the Enya thing goes under the radar. So when Enya and them heard it, um, I literally just had to get on the phone with her, you feel me? And um, and I did get on the phone with her, shout out to Enya. She was amazing and she, I explained to her what hip hop was, what kind of rap we was doing. And t- also told her like, I'm, you know, the son of a minister, you feel me? Um, I went through my whole Christian catalog with her. And <laughs> after that, she was like, okay, I like this. I like this. You're cool. It's a go. She still made sure Sony paid her money, though. You dig? <laughs> <laughs> she's she's mysterious. Like, she lives out in, like, a castle in Ireland. And, like, you know, she's, she's no one ever sees her. Like, what was, that was supposed to be cool to talk to her? Enya's in a castle, and I'm from Haiti. So I think, like, it would just be a cool conversation. You feel me? And it's like, I'm just talking to her, like, She's Enya and I'm Clef, we're just two humans. You dig? That's just how hip hop goes. As an artist whose own music goes on to get sampled, are you sensitive about who uses your work? I think every artist is, period. You know what I'm saying? To you, when when Khaled needed to sample my work, that's my longtime brother. And he know he could have just sampled that. He personally called me and he ran me through his whole vision, what he wanted to do with Rihanna. Um, then I got Santana on the phone and it was all good. But... You know, I always believe like, so I sampled Enya, but it's respect. You know what I'm saying to you? So anytime I sample something, it's like either most likely as a as a writer and a producer, it's like you're sampling the thing that you wish that you actually had created yourself. 
the original person, when they hear it, they got to be like, holy shit, this is a real spin. You know what I mean? Because it's like, it's your art. Yeah. So can you imagine like your art and somebody taking the head apart? Yeah. It's and your, putting it's, it like where the feet is at, taking a seat. Like you really got to be creative. And you got to trust the person and you got to trust that they're going to take care of your art. Yeah. And the only way you can do that is when you hear it. Speaking of the Fugees, I got to ask, last year you guys performed together for the first time in over a decade. What did it take to make that moment happen? I mean, it's just magic. The Fugees is magic. At the time, Global Citizens is a cause that we all believed in. We stood in, we stood for, we decided we're going to do that. And we decided that we was going to do the tour. And then um, we was ready to go. And then uh, COVID happened, slowed us down. Um, if you look, you'll see, I think like a month ago, I was with Lauren. We was at the Essence Festival together. You know, we came out, blew the place in half. And, um, and I always tell the Fuji fans, just buckle up, you know, um, we're definitely going to re-pick back up where we left off. Um, I think COVID slowed everything down. So, yeah, so I, that's that's my next question. We have something to look forward to there? Definitely buckle up. Let's take a listen to another song. What was your favorite Whitney Houston song growing up? I believe the children are the future. Tell me when you, if we first heard that. Do you remember? The greatest love of all. Yeah. I was in high school and just heard that. And, um, you know, and we in the hood, you feel me? So we going through craziness. You know, it's like I, I'm in Newark, New Jersey at the time. You know, students are being, you know, it's like the crack era. So, you know, you going outside, you hit the avenue. Dice is being played, people getting shot, you feel me? And then all of a sudden, Whitney says, I believe the children of the future. And it's not like we ain't hear that song before, but it was the tonality and the way she did it. It just drew all of us in, you know? And then me being like the son of a minister, um, her vocals just talked to me um, different. It was like people sing, but Whitney like sang, you know what I'm saying to you? So... That was my natural attraction to Whitney. Can you tell me the story that I heard about your recording of that song? I always find this kind of stuff really interesting when people get to work with their heroes or people they really respect, but then they're producing them so they have to give them feedback. And yeah. like I heard about this moment where like <laughs> I know. <laughs> you yeah. had to can you tell me that story? Funny. Do you know what story I'm talking about? I I a hundred percent know the story. So basically I got Whitney in the studio and we're recording and you know, it's my love's your love. And, you know, once again, this is Whitney Houston. And you have to understand I'm like a kid in the candy store. And all of a sudden, Whitney's doing something. And when I'm doing a playback, yo, a note sounded like it was flat, right? This is when the room gets silent for me, flat. You can hear Penny. Now, this is as a producer, do I go ahead and tell the great Whitney Houston, yo, the tape, this was flat, so we have to go again. But once again, as a producer, you have to do your job. Do like you, you, do you remember what part it was? Um, yeah, of course, I remember. Um, uh, oh, and I asked the Lord what I did with my life. I will say, I did it with you, right? And she does this little bluesy thing. And then I stopped it. I was like, Whitney, you know, there's this part right here. It was flat. And <laughs> silence, like, like I was like, okay, she's about to be like, you know, F the session. <laughs> I'm out of here. Who does this kid think he is? And then she was like, baby, it's not flat. I just bent the note. Okay, mic drop, bro. <laughs> Mic drop, right? Because now when I went back and I heard the take, right? And once she said that, like her ear was so ill that she can bend that note like B.B. King on blues guitar and then bring it back to the key. But I wasn't even inclined to hear that yet until she said that. So that was pretty, that was my, 
that was my amazing Whitney Houston time. What do you learn from something like that? My ear, if it was in jazz I was playing, I didn't feel like it could go chromatic like that on a pop song. I didn't feel that you should bend that note. And being that my brain was tuned like that, it just sounded flat to me, mm. which was wrong. Let me uh, let me play another track. Take a listen. They know I'm on tonight. Yeah. My hips don't lie. And I'm starting to feel it's right. All the attraction, the tension. Don't you see, baby, Shit, this yeah. is... So I think a lot of people would know that song. What they might not know is you released a version of that song years before you gave it to Shakira, right? A hundred percent. The original version of that song came out for... A movie that I think Clive was executive producing, the soundtrack for called Havana Nights. And I submitted this song with an artist called Claudette Artis. And if anybody go back and watch Havana Night, you will hear this this song, I think, from beginning to end, I think three minutes of it. And um, and then uh, years later, uh, I got a call from Donnie Einer from Columbia, Charlie Walk. And I was like, yo, we're working with Shakira. And we need you to do that injection that you did with Destiny Child. You know, we felt like she couldn't be the thing, you know? And I was like, hmm, I probably got a record that we could probably remix. And sent them, sent the record to Shakira. She heard it. She loved it. We met in Miami. Um, she cut it. And then the rest is history. When did you yeah. know that, that that version you did with Shakira of Hipstone Live was going to be big? You know how I know the joint was big? When I got a call and they said they wanted me to remix this for the World Cup. Now, as somebody who loves football, AKA soccer for people who don't know what I'm saying, right? <laughs> I was like, I was like, yo, now I watch football. You feel what I'm saying? I was like, yo, there's a billion people who, who watch it. I said, yo, this joint must really be killing it. Then, then all of the things started coming in from Sony, like these plaques. And then it was like, one was like, yo, you have the biggest airplay song of all time. And I promise you, I didn't know what they was talking about. They was like, yo, this, this, you know, this is up there with the Michael Jackson and the Elvis airplay of all time. And my man's like, yo, airplay, like this, the radio plays this like it's out of style. You know what I'm saying? And I was like, damn, well, the last time the radio played something until it was out of style, I think it was killing me softly. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. It's funny to think about how much has changed since then. Like now, I was just talking to a 19-year-old pop star, Tate McRae, like a couple of days ago, you know, like hundreds of hundreds of millions of streams. And I, I asked her about the radio and she said, yeah, she said, really, I just care about TikTok these days, you know? Well, I think like TikTok, Instagram, those are the new radios. So that's where they get all their music. It's just different right there on their phone, click, click, and they go. We, we spent this conversation talking about some of the biggest hits you produced for other people. What's the song that you cherish the most that you produced for yourself? Will probably be, be a record called Gone to November. A big, big hit, especially here in Canada. Oh, that's what's up, baby. Wyclef, nice to talk to you. Thanks for making the time. All right, you too. Thank you.